Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. For several weeks now, we will be in this different gospel uh, and hearing about the journey of Jesus through this evangelist's eyes. We begin at chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever would believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Last week I came across a post in an online group for preachers preparing their sermons. It read, Nicodemus, the journey. John 3, active questioner. John 7, Defender of due process. John 19, extravagant mourner. I was intrigued, and now I'm convinced Nicodemus is us. The story of his relationship with Jesus is the story of those of us who see Jesus, who are drawn to him, and who want to know more. This is a lifelong path. And like every path, it begins with birth. And birth, while a natural process, isn't always an easy one. Context is everything. Let's begin by noticing how very close to the beginning of Jesus' ministry we are in this passage. This is John's gospel. So Jesus has already performed his first sign water to wine at the wedding at Cana. And also he has had his first truly controversial public moment, driving the money changers and the sellers of livestock out of the temple, snapping a whip and spitting out an angry quote from scripture. This morning's passage is the very next thing John's gospel tells us. Nicodemus, a well-educated, well-respected man, a religious leader among his and Jesus' people, goes to speak to Jesus, and he goes at night. 
I asked my Sunday school class what they thought about that. Why did he go at night? And they said, didn't want to be seen. And I think that's true. John's gospel makes a big deal out of darkness and light, which is to say daytime and nighttime. It doesn't have anything to do with skin color. It has to do with whether we can see or we can't see. Is a nighttime visit a sign of Nicodemus's discomfort with Jesus? Is it about fear of what others will think? Is it a sign he will never truly commit to the life of faith? He arrives and begins with words of respect and affirmation. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So Nicodemus has heard about the water into wine and maybe other signs of God's power working through Jesus, maybe a healing or the casting out of a demon. And he hasn't asked a question exactly. He's saying what he sees, what he believes he knows already. Jesus replies with a sentence that causes some confusion. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, or being born anew, or being born again. This one word in Greek has three meanings. I think Jesus is actually giving Nicodemus some words of respect and affirmation right then. He's telling Nicodemus, you see it. You see the kingdom, which means you have been born anew. Because there you are, asking questions. You are engaged. You want to know more. Your birth, your rebirth, has already begun. But when Nicodemus responds, he sounds as if he has taken Jesus' words to mean something very specific and very literal. That Jesus wants us somehow to return to the womb and then reemerge into the world. He says, we can't do that. You know what? I'm not buying it. I'm not buying that Nicodemus attaches immediately to the most absurd interpretation of what Jesus says. He knows better than that. He has studied the scriptures his entire life. He knows that truth can be spoken through history and law and logic, yes, but also through poetry and song and metaphor. I don't think Nicodemus is challenging Jesus. I think he's trying to get him to say more. His answer might even be playful, humorous. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. That means he's all about conversation, conversation that leads to learning, to growth. He is trying to get a conversation going. And this is the point. Jesus, in every gospel, spreads the kingdom first with words. And in every gospel, people ask him questions. For some people, the questions are truly about wanting to know more. For others, not so much. The questions of Nicodemus the Pharisee and the questions of the fishermen who followed Jesus around are equally important, equally an intricate part of how Jesus shares the good news. The point isn't being smart or educated. The point is being interested. And a conversation is born. Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus, in order to be a part of the kingdom, you must be born of water and the spirit. And the winds of the spirit blow where they choose. You may hear the wind blowing, but no one knows where it came from. No one knows where it's going. In one sense, Jesus here is describing the utter freedom of God from any preconceived notions of how God acts. The Holy Spirit is like the wind. You can't know about God's ways of working any more than you can know the secret mind of the breeze that just suddenly became a gale. And the water? Jesus 
knows that Nicodemus is already keyed into that. By this point in the gospel, Jesus' connection to John, who baptizes with water, that's well known. So too are the waters of the womb, the waters of birth, the waters of rebirth. How can these things be, Nicodemus asks. And the question hangs in the air. Nicodemus' last words in this conversation, which Jesus eventually tells him, is all about love. The love of God for humanity, the love of God for the whole world. The next time Nick and Jesus cross paths, they're in the temple near the end of the festival of Sukkot. That's a harvest festival that also commemorates the 40 years that God's people were wandering in the wilderness. Jesus stands there and he cries out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow streams of living water. Now, he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. There were lots of different reactions to Jesus' mini sermon. When they heard the word, some in the crowd said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some asked, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Some people wanted to arrest him, but the temple police went to consult with some Pharisees before making any moves. Some were all for arrest, but Nicodemus spoke up. Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? Nicodemus is certainly a voice for due process, but once again, for him, it's all about the conversation. Let's ask questions, he says. Let's hear the answers. Does it really make sense to leap to judgment? Is that really how we want to do things, we people who all claim to be seeking God's will? One of the ongoing challenges of faith is not to be afraid of the conversations, not to fear the questions. Scripture scholar Caroline Lewis writes, we tend to talk about our faith and having faith assuming that it's a done deal, as simple as acquiring faith. But the Gospel of John never refers to faith as a noun. Faith is not a possession, not something that one gets, not something that one has. It's something that one does. Believing for the characters in the fourth Gospel is a verb, she writes, and as a verb, Believing is subject to all of the ambiguity, all of the uncertainty, and all the indecisiveness of being human. We need to ask more often than we are willing to admit, how can these things be? The final place we find Nicodemus in this gospel is in chapter 19 following the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, who is described as a secret follower of Jesus, asks Pontius Pilate to release the body for burial. Joseph and Nicodemus take possession of it and prepare it for the tomb. Nicodemus brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes for the preparation, weighing, the gospel tells us, about a hundred pounds, an extravagant, almost comical amount. It's hard to imagine his having any motive for this other than real grief, real reverence for the rabbi he interrogated at the outset of his ministry. How can these things be? In chapter 19, those words echo with a completely different meaning. How can Jesus, whose purpose was to show the love of God for the whole world, be still, silent, ready for those spices and the shroud of burial? 
Nicodemus was one of a small handful of disciples who stayed with Jesus to the very end. And even beyond, as he performed the heartbreaking task, the mitzvah, the good action of anointing the broken body. He and Joseph will place Jesus' body in the garden tomb, where the weekend will serve as a time of gestation for another glorious birth, rebirth. The next person to see Jesus will mistake him for the gardener. Nicodemus is us. We see the trajectory of a life in faith, not faith as a noun, settled, closed, like a book you've read and are done with, but faith as a verb. Faith as a question that leads to another question and then to yet another. Faith as a willingness to ask questions, even in the face of difficulty, in the face of challenge. Faith as one ready to love extravagantly, even to a puzzling place where not knowing is one with the pain of loss and yet so tantalizingly close to birth, to rebirth. The story of Nicodemus is the story of those of us who see Jesus, who are drawn to him, and who want to know more. Each of us walks a lifelong path of questions and conversations in which we ask again and again, how can these things be? Each of us experiences cycles of confusion and renewal, like death and rebirth. Each of us is part of a beautiful, lifelong conversation with the one who loves our questions and delights in them and longs for us to ask more. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>